Welcome to the Virtual Memories Show. I'm your host, Gil Roth, and we're here to preserve and promote culture, one weekly conversation at a time. You can subscribe to the Virtual Memories Show through iTunes, Spotify, YouTube, Google Play, and a whole bunch of other venues. Just visit our sites, chimeraobscura.com slash vm or vmspod.com to find more information, along with our RSS feed. And follow the show on Twitter and Instagram at vmspod. Well, this uh, this weekend was my my artiversary, the one year mark from when I got inspired by John Lurie's HBO show Painting with John and uh, picked up a, a pad and a pencil and tried to draw some trees in my backyard. They came out terrible, um, terribly, whatever. Um, but I kept up with drawing every day. And as I've talked about on the show before, that's been pretty life changing. And to celebrate the uh, the artiversary, I thought I would draw those trees again and, and, you know, show you guys how much better I am as an artist. But uh, it's way too damn cold out this weekend. So I spent Sunday instead um, making my first comic. The uh, the work kind of leaked into the following day, and I, I, I reinvented a lot of wheels in the process. But but I managed to make a two-page, eight-panel comic about my artiversary and John Lurie and Derek Delgadio and turning 50 and getting leukemia. And um, sheesh, that's a lot of stuff to pack into eight panels. But, but anyway, I did it. And it's something I always wanted to do, make at least one comic in my life. And now, you know, um, now I feel like I should learn how to do it better, much in the way I look back at that first drawing of those three trees, which I reproduced for this comic, um, and just, just uh, I'm agog at, at how bad it really was. Um, I'm sure if I keep up with making comics, I will feel the same way about this one, but, but it was my first one and it was pretty cool to figure it all out and write, draw, letter, everything. And, um, Comics can be powerful stuff, is is what I guess I'm saying. Now, speaking of, last week was Holocaust Remembrance Day, and that, I think, coincided to the day with a Tennessee school board deciding that Art Spiegelman's comic about his, his family's Holocaust history, Mouse, uh, was not suitable for eighth grade kids. Mouse is a harrowing book. Uh, no doubt about it. It's also a monumental achievement in, in comics and in Holocaust memoir. Um, I remember loaning it to a Russian lit professor back in the early 90s when I was at college. Now, keep in mind, comics did not have mainstream approval then. It was weird to see something in comics, much less, you know, a, a, a nonfiction topic like this. Um, she gave it back to me the following week, absolutely horrified, and said that Art's family's story was too terrible and should never have been recounted. And I don't think she was talking about how it shouldn't have been done as a comic or with the anthropomorphization of the humans into to mice and cats. I think she meant that the horror of Art's family's Holocaust story was just too much for her, which of course, is why we have to remember it and recount these stories. This professor was not Jewish. I uh, don't know anything about her family's Eastern European history. Um, but, you know, telling those stories from the, the Holocaust is how we, you know, quote unquote, put it in its proper context. But one of the interesting things about this week's show is that my guest looked not just at the Holocaust, but what came before. And it's it's in keeping with the recent episode I had with Ken Crimstein about the um, uh, autobiographies of Lithuanian Jewish teenagers uh, in the years leading up to the war and all the, the lives that were lost then. But, but my guest this week, Glenn Kurtz, he explored that that context and what it means in his 2014 book, Three Minutes in Poland which was recently adapted into a documentary uh, called Three Minutes, A Lengthening by Bianca Stigter. Uh, Glenn's book 
is about his discovery of three minutes of home movie footage that his grandfather took during a, a 1938 visit to his homeland in, in Poland, the, the town of Nashelska. And the town is majority Jewish. And within a few years of that 1938 visit, around 95% of them would be dead, mostly in, in Treblinka. Now, Glenn, Glenn helped get the footage that he found restored, uh, got it added to the, the National Holocaust Museum. And he engaged in this search to find out all he could about what was, what was in those three minutes of film and about the people who appear, the, the throngs that, that come out of, of Shul and they all want to be seen by this American and his little handheld movie camera. And it's all just a few crowd shots um, outside Shul in a town square, a few moments in a restaurant with townspeople peeking in the window and a couple of other settings. And, and in the process, Glenn manages to find some of the survivors from the town, all in their 80s and 90s, who are able to, to fill in a few of the blanks and identify people and identify themselves. And in the process, you know, he learns the stories of, of what it took to survive those years in Poland, but also a little bit of what life was like before, you know, in, in those moments in 1938 when, when nobody saw this coming. And yeah, you can say people should have seen it coming. I, I know, I know. But, but think of some nine or ten year old kid, and and him again in his eighties or nineties with all the horrors he's lived through, just seeing that moment of himself again, something he he never would have seen when the entire town was was razed and, and annihilated. So three minutes in Poland. Um, the subtitle is "Discovering a Lost World in a 1938 Family Film." It's a harrowing and beautiful book. It's a testimony to the the survivors, um, those who, who Glenn gets to speak to, but but it's also this amazing exploration of of chance and the near impossibility that any of our stories will live on beyond us. I mean, everything that had to happen for Glenn to capture what he captured in this book it, it's it's a miracle and it's it's a, a work of wonder. I mean, the question he's really after. What remains when someone dies is what, what haunts us all. So go read Three Minutes in Poland. Go check out Three Minutes, A Lengthening, the documentary, if it's in a, a festival near you. It's just finishing up with, with Sundance in the, the last week or so. Um, from what I've seen, just a trailer and what I've read of it, the director takes a really daring approach of just showing the three minutes of footage for the entire movie. And it's it's done in different ways. It's it's the straight three minutes. It's clipped in different parts. It's extended in, in time through slow motion. It's focused, you know, zooming in on different parts of the film. But it never breaks from just those three minutes that remind us that, that the Holocaust wasn't just about the death of the Jews, but about the life of the Jews, if you get me. Here's Glenn's bio from the book. There's a longer one at his website, glennkurtz.com. Glenn Kurtz is the author of Practicing, A Musician's Return to Music, and Three Minutes in Poland, Discovering a Lost World in a 1938 Family Film. He was the host of Conversations on Practice, a series of public conversations about writing held at McNally Jackson Books in New York City. And now, the Virtual Memories Conversation with Glenn Kurtz. Given that, that Three Minutes in Poland is, we'll say, eight years old, seven to eight years, first, how long did it take you to recover from researching and writing that book? And and what was it like returning to it for the the documentary that's been produced around it? Mm. Well, Which is two questions, not one, but still. And they're both great questions. Um, you know, no one has asked me it in those terms. How long did it take me to recover? And it's actually a really important question. There was something about this story, about this project that was so intimate and demanding emotionally um, and um you know, there was an obsessive quality sort of from my side. A lot of it had to do, of course, with the, the nature of the story. Any kind of Holocaust story, I think, is emotionally demanding. But then also 
because I, I ended up meeting survivors and speaking with them and people entrusted me with, you know, their most painful memories. And, and that demanded a great deal just to, to bear witness to and to be in the presence of, and to do honor to, you know, in the course of writing the book, to do justice to it. So it was a, a very d different kind of project than anything else that I had done before. And when it was finished, that is to say, when the manuscript was finished, when the book came out, um, I had a great sort of sense of postpartum depression. I, I, I yeah. thought, you know, this, like, will I ever have a project? Will I ever have a story again that goes so deeply and that connects me so intimately to people in the process of writing it? Writing, of course, can often be a very solitary thing. Um, so it took a long time to recover. I, you know, I, I wondered, was any other project going to ever be feel worth it? in the way sure. that this felt worth it. Um, so to answer the question more, you know, more briefly, I don't think I have recovered in a way. Well, br brief isn't really my, my edict here. <laughs> 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 meandering divagation is what I'm all about. Well, but, but go on. <laughs> thank you. That's meandering is good for me too. Um, yeah, I don't know that I have recovered. And in a way I'm, I'm trying to find that as a good thing um, that the, there was something about this story also that kind of broke broke me open. I think, yeah. um, again, because it it demanded a a willingness to um, to accept, you know, not only, and this was the most amazing thing about the project altogether. Just to dive into the heart of it right away, yeah. um, it demanded, of course, just a a, a kind of openness and strength to to listen to the stories that people had to tell me and to bear witness to the the pain the lifelong just truly inconceivable pain that these experiences had had left behind but also you know having shared that with people and having been in a position because of the nature i mean i i was in touch with many different people um, who were, who you know, were connected to the story in many different ways. Many of whom ended up having connections among themselves, either old family connections or they met and spoke and became very close. There was a a, a, a human interpersonal living connection um, that that developed as a result of this among a community of people. And so not only to be present for the pain of the stories that people had to relate to, to me, but also to be open to the sort of outpouring of, I mean, of love that, and of release that, um, that telling these stories and then finding a community of people who cared about these stories created not not only for the survivors but also for for the descendants, uh, particularly for the second generation people, um, because that's also often a very lonely existence. People who grow up with Holocaust survivor parents, um, it's a very fraught dynamic, emotional dynamic in the families. Um, often the parents don't talk very much about it. Um, and so the children are left with this great sense of absence, you know, just in terms of the story, in terms of information, as well as this terrible sense of absence for the, the, the lost relatives, the lost context that, that their parents live in every day. So to then have a community of people who have experienced something similar or with whom they can share, you know, knowledge um, and information um, that, that opens up a kind of an open heartedness, a release of pent up lifelong emotion. So, yeah, I mean, I, this is my meandering answer, but it's, there's, there was so much emotion and so much live emotion that I hadn't anticipated that um, I don't know that I have recovered. And that's, that's what I wonder. I mean, I, <laughs> this will sound terrible and crass. We've all gone down internet video rabbit holes. 
you know, YouTube videos that, that kind of draw us in farther and farther and farther. In this case, you're, you're pre YouTube and this film created an entirely new world for you. And, and I don't want to say eaten up, but, but has, has filled years of your life. And it raised the question, did you know what you were getting into? Did, did you anticipate any anything on the scale of, of A, what the book turned into, B, what effect it's had on your life? <laughs> no, not at all. I had no idea what I was getting into. And I mean, when I first discovered my grandfather's film, um, and this was in 2009, you know, I, I watched it and there's hundreds of people in the frame, lots of children waving, kind of competing for attention. And it's so lively. And I looked at it, and of course, you have this this fantasy, I suppose, at that time, oh, maybe, maybe someone's still alive that, I, you know, maybe I can show this to someone who's, who's in it. And in fact, that happened, ultimately. Yeah. But in, in the instant that I first looked at it, you know, that's like a passing fancy. I was like, oh, wouldn't it be great if that such a thing were possible? There's no sense for what it would actually mean if it were to happen. And this, this is a story that keeps unfolding and is continuing to unfold now. I mean, it's 10 years after the sort of the big break in the case. It's 13 years or yeah. so since I found the film and still it's unfolding. And, and so that's so astonishing to me. And at no stage could I have anticipated what the next stage was, was going to be like. And, um, it's, it's really just been, um, an astonishing experience from, you know, from the start. When I first found it, what I thought I had was a memorial, you know, uh, a, a, um, something that preserved the memory of people who had died. And of course, that is true. Um, but it's also, as I was saying before, become this kind of nodal point for so many, you know, living connections and for a whole community of people. And now with the film, you know, it's a story that's sort of being, I mean, it's being screened worldwide. It's just yeah. astonishing to me that these three minutes of film, these three minutes of very amateurish home movie film just kind of have so much, it has so much content, so much density, so much heart, <laughs> so much information yeah. that um, it, we still haven't, you know, it, it still hasn't finished unfolding. Well, it's yeah, it's interesting. A you know, in terms of as the the book unfolds, the repeated returns to to almost frame by frame analysis, trying to understand or recreate certain things that are there. But also, this episode will be airing one week after one with David Thompson, uh, the the film critic and writer, who his most recent book speculates on how film the subject of film is its inherent duplicitousness that what you think you see isn't always what's there and that's that's inherent in the the very nature of film and i mean you know to me it was a neat twist early on in the book when you discover that the town you thought you were looking at isn't the town you were looking at right and how different people, even near the end, where you have a, a realization of who someone is based on a, a a ring, that this might be the person who's seen elsewhere in the three minutes. The ways film, as it's in and of itself, is you know this this sort of storytelling mode that also a is open to interpretation, but b undercuts itself uh, sometimes that you don't know for sure, and you you do spend so much time contextualizing or trying to add meaning. As I say, meandering divigation. So it's, it's on my side, too, not just yours. No, I mean, that's such an important point, and it's so germane to this project. I mean, you know, and maybe it's heightened by the fact that this, well, I mean, it's not a Holocaust film. It's a film of pre, a pre-Holocaust era film. But because that looms over these people, it feels like, you know, a... Um, that it that it belongs to that history, which of course it does, and it gives such added poignancy to it. But the urgency to understand what are we looking at um, was what 
what sort of motivated me. I just kept asking, what am I seeing? What, what's in, what, what is this? I mean, it's a silly, basic question. And yet if you ask it persistently enough, it's unanswerable in the end. You know, you can, and, and this is, I think, going, going to that, that point of the duplicitousness. It's like, you think you see something and, and you're often tricked into thinking, oh, because I see it, I know it. But you can look at this and know absolutely nothing. If you just look at it and there's no context, then it then it means something fundamentally different than if you look at it and know, oh my goodness, you know, in, in one year, these people would be under German occupation and within three years, 90% of them would be dead. That changes what you see. It changes what's in the frame, though nothing in the frame has changed. Um, yeah. And then, of course, you know, okay, well, that's one thing to know that generically about, you know, these are Polish Jews, and we know what happens to Polish Jews. But to say, no, this is Chaim Nussen Zweikhoft, who was the, you know, Metzaivik Kritzler, the man who chiseled the headstones at the cemetery. And he, you know, performed these functions in town, and here's stories about him as a person, as a human being. And then looking at the film, again, still not even putting it in a Holocaust context, just saying, oh, now I'm not just looking at, you know, a guy with a black beard who stands there, but no, I'm looking at a person who has a history, who has a life, who has a family, you know, and putting them in context. That also changes what you're looking at. And to, you know, the more you can the more you look at it as a source of information and the more you try to pin down what that information is, the more you realize you'll never know. There's more here than can ever possibly be grasped. And, and so that duplicity is, you know, it's, I mean, duplicity, I think, is being generous. I don't know what the, <laughs> what the multiplicity <laughs> word is for duplicity, but, you know, it's depth. It, it's you know the, it's bottomless. The the if you just keep asking what am I looking at, you'll never come to an answer. And in a sense, the the film will just keep opening and opening. I mean, I think that's one of the reasons why it's had the life that it that it has, because you know I I kept asking that question, and now with the documentary film, um, the director Bianca Stichter. Um, also, I think it takes that similar approach of just like, okay, what's here? What are we actually looking at? And you're going to zoom in on just these, you know, fine details, the buttons on people's clothing. Like, what do we know about the buttons? You know, what do we know about these, these objects that are hanging on the, on the door frame in the background? What do we know about the mezuzot that are on the wall, you know, in the door frame in the back, in the background? Like, the more you look, just the more you realize you'll you'll really never get to the bottom of what you're looking at. And this is the CSI enhance the resolution right. world. This is what what's on the film is all that's there. So that's right. how involved were you in the uh, in the documentary itself? Um yeah, I was I was very involved in the content side of it. Um mm -hmm. you know the um again for all of the reasons that we've just been discussing, um you know if you just have the footage you don't know anything. Um, right. And of course, not knowing anything is a perfectly happy position for many people, many, <laughs> frankly, many filmmakers. Um, yeah. You know, and you put some klezmer music behind it, and then you have, you know, these happy pictures <laughs> of people in pre-war Poland. And, and a lot of Holocaust documentary does that, right? It doesn't have this demand for precision and for detail it's really happy with these generic images um but uh, bianca the director was is also a professional historian and i think also has this sensibility of really wanting to pin down what it is that we're looking at and she uses the the camera um as this kind of forensic instrument in the same way that that i tried to when i was researching the film so yeah we we spent a lot of time together talking about what was in the frame um the you know the use of the camera is, is entirely her work a lot of the content that we talk about is comes from my research um, but it was we, yeah we worked together quite a lot it's it's weird because another recent episode i did was with the uh 
the cartoonist Ken Krimstein, mm -hmm. uh, who did a, he adapted a number of stories of Lithuanian teens written autobiographically in the thirties, Jewish teens. Um, and among those, there's a sense they knew something was coming and it's, it's your interviews with the, the survivors from Nashelsk. It, it's weird, but there's less of that sense. It, it, it seemed more that only, you know, with, with the arrival of the Germans, did, that it turned into holy crap, you know, right. the world has just been torn asunder. Did you get that sense that they, they suspected or saw anything coming prior? Or was it really just, you know, inside their world, things looked relatively secure? Well, I mean, it's hard to say. I, I'm at the mercy of the people who, who I happened to speak to, which is to say the people right. who happened to live long enough for, for me to meet them. Sure. Um, and so it's a very unscientific sample. Um, and then, you know, retrospectively, it's very hard to, to grasp what you what you knew, what you thought, yeah. what you and that's what's what's interesting intimated. with the stuff Ken's working from right. is that it was in the moment. Right. So you know these guys are all looking back sixty, seventy years. Sure, uh, when you're talking to them. Sure. Well, and I think that the the material Ken's working with isn't that wasn't it created through the original Evo? It was a survey yeah. that was sent out. So I mean, these may have been politically more aware kids. That is to say, they were already sort of involved in sure. Jewish culture. I don't know. But no, among the survivors that I spoke to, there were, you know, some who, who like they were aware of politics. Of course, you couldn't not be aware of, of Hitler and what he was saying. And they would, they would hear his speeches on the radio. And um, and certainly in the months leading up to um, the invasion of Poland in September 1939, you know, as the as the crisis, so to speak, was escalating, um, there were there were among the survivors some who said, "Look, I knew something bad was going to happen." But of course, they are all kids at that time, somewhere between the ages of, I don't know, eight and and. 15 or 16. So, you know, their awareness of world politics is, is limited by that. And it's a small town. And also, you know, remember, it, Poland was allied with Germany, with uh, England and France. And Poland had a, you know, a fine, quite large and well-trained army. And they had this feeling that, like, well, yeah, the Germans may invade, but then England and France are going to come to our rescue. And, you know, like, there wasn't this sense that, like, oh, it's going to lead to the Warsaw Ghetto in Treblinka, right? Like, no one conceived of such a thing. They knew that it would be bad if the Germans invaded, and they, there was a sense of tension about that. But, yeah, I mean, no one... No one imagined, no one that I spoke to imagined anything like what happened. Do you feel out of place when you went to Poland? You, you go into the concerns you had going in. Yeah. But, you know, what did you feel the mm. first time you went? Well, yeah, I mean. I it, mean, the first time you went for this project. The first time I mentioned. went for this project. In fact, yes, yeah. I had gone in the, early, in the mid 1980s to date myself when I was uh, living abroad. And that was, of course, still under communism. And I didn't, it didn't even occur to me that I could, you know, visit the places my ancestors were from. I just went, I went to Krakow and to Warsaw. And then it was very different. I felt very American going into communist Poland. Um, in 2012, when I visited for the first time for this project, I very much felt like an American Jew <laughs> coming. Yeah. Um, to Poland. Um, and that was strange to me. Um, it's not an identity that I, that, that feels at the forefront of my mind all the time in my regular life and, or when I travel elsewhere. Um, but it absolutely, I find, I find impossible to believe as, as an American Jew, I, and, and not a practicing one by any means, nonetheless, it's my constant background buzz, but we're different people. Yeah. So, yeah. Well, and I mean, <laughs> yeah, maybe it is sort of in the background. I mean, I lived in Austria, you know, I, yeah. I, I, you know, didn't spend a lot of time in Germany. It's, but it's different in Poland also because I was going specifically for the purpose of, in a sense, representing this community. And so everybody yeah. that I met re responded to me as the representative of the Jewish community of Nischelsk. And so 
it, it, it may also be a sort of contextual thing that that's just the role that I was playing on some level. Um, but just personally, no, it felt incredibly strange. Um, you know, I, I, and I can't tell how much of that is just, you know, small town life. A stranger, an American comes to a town that doesn't usually get tourists and everybody's kind of peeking out the window from behind the curtains to watch me walk mm. down the street, you know, like to see what am I there for? Um, so there's a k- kind of oddness to being there, self-consciousness to being there just in the first place. Then there's also, because I'm there to represent the Jewish community, then immediately I, I trigger certain, you know, fears and suspicions that may lurk in the local consciousness for some people. Um, I mean, it's something of a cliche to say that, you know, the, when a Jew arrives in a town in Poland, the first thing they think is, ah, he's here to take back our, you know, to take back his home, yeah. right? To take our homes from us. Um, and again, it's a, well, simultaneously it, saying there were never any Jews here. Right. So we don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> well, it, it's, yeah. it's a very complex situation. And I say that as a yeah. cliche, and I mean that it's a cliche. It, it's by no means the sole response that I received, I met wonderful people and I was received with tremendous warmth and, and graciousness. And, um, you know, I, I have dear, dear friends in this town and, and, and in Poland now. But there is the also, like, again, the first time that I go there, you know, I'm very hyper aware of the responses and the, the looks that I'm getting and whether I'm interpreting those looks correctly or not, you know, is another question. But, and I'm also, you know, walking in ground first that my grandfather walked in, like he left as a small child. He may not even have been able to walk <laughs> when he left in the 1890s. Um, uh, but then of course he went back in 1938. So I am walking on, on ground that he walked one way or another. And then, you know, I'm, I'm walking in a town where this film is shot and where, you know, on the street where it takes place. And so, you know, there's a sense of ghosts all around. And, you know, some, some Jews who go back to Poland, Jews of Polish heritage, who go back and feel that, you know, that the whole country in a sense is haunted by ghosts in that way. I, 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 there is that sense. And for me, it was intensely heightened because of the film, because I had those images in my mind. I was carrying photographs, you know, with me when I went to the town and very much had this sense that I was walking in a haunted space. You worked with a, a Gentile historian in the Shelsk. Yeah, it's so Wyszwald Savinsky. Yeah, and the one thing I was dying for was Understanding more about him and his motivations, why he he elected this path after his, his years teaching and, you know, what it, what he knew about, you know, Jewish life before the war and what he could share with you. Yeah. Sort of what motivated that, that, that choice of life for him? Yeah, I, I mean, I can't speak to his motivations. Um, he's a wonderful man. Um, kind, yeah, I don't mean any sinister man. way. I'm just wondering, and, you know, the, the guy who decides, yeah, this is, somebody needs to chronicle this, and I guess I'm going to be the guy. You know, I, I mean, I'll, I'll zoom out for a second and just say, you know, it's it's not unusual in Polish towns, often small, particularly small Polish towns, <laughs> that one person somehow self-selects to be the keeper of the town's Jewish memory. Um, it, it happens so frequently that, you know, and it, and it could be, you know, the local director of the high school, like uh, Mr. Suvinsky, or it can be, you know, just some, you know, the, uh, the, the local plumber or the, like just someone who, who for whatever reason feels that connection and feels that there's something meaningful about trying to preserve that history, who takes on that task and, and somehow protects the memory, whether it means caring for the cemetery or trying to preserve artifacts. And it's rarely a popular job. Um, and it's rarely a sort of socially <laughs> advantageous <laughs> job. But nevertheless, people do it. And so in Nashville's that Mr. Suvinsky is the man who did that. And it happened that he's you know, highly educated, also a trained historian. And so he pursued it with a historian's um, attentiveness. 
over you know many 20 30 years um and it happened that he's when i met him he was the director of the the local high school the public high school and it happens that the building that houses the public high school was originally built in 1922 as a yeshiva um, by a man named david leib schmernach who did not survive the war um, although his wife did and there was a process after the war in 46 and 40 through 48 for her trying to either regain possession of the building or to get restitution which she lost she did not receive um, compensation for the, the loss of that building um, it became property of the town and the town and it's still the high school so mr suvinsky saw that history also as something that was deserving to be preserved and to be you know um, documented uh, with a historian's um, with the historian's craft and with um, historian's sensitivity. So he, you know, I, I, I don't know how he came upon the task of preserving the town's Jewish heritage, but, but he did. And yeah, um, you're awful glad. And I, yeah, he, he's um, just completed a book now about the, um, the German occupation of Nashelsk with particular emphasis on those first three months. Um, Prior to you know, so the the Germans arrive almost immediately after the invasion. Probably by the third or the fourth of September, they're in total possession of the town, and then just three months later, um, on December third, nineteen thirty nine, the entire Jewish population is deported um, uh, over the course of well, two days, I suppose, uh, December third and December fourth. Um, so it's just there's three months between when the Germans arrive and when the Jewish population there is, is deported. They, they weren't killed then. Um, they were deported to in other towns um, and ultimately confined to ghettos there, but they were expelled from their hometown. Um, and so in those first three months, um, that's sort of the focus of his, of his research, and he's uncovered an enormous amount of new information um, about the the individuals um, in the town under under the German occupation. So, yeah, I, I it's a how shall I say a godsend that yeah. I uh, that I met him and that uh, and that we've been been friends since since then for ten years now. Let me ask, and you could tell me if this is way too uh, personal or weird a question. You ever get a sense or impulse? to pursue Judaism more, more formally over the course of this? Like in the, they're going to persecute us anyway, I should at least, you know, know my Judaism. Being Jewish and, you know, like me, not observant, um, it, it sounds like. You know, you thought of saying Kaddish at the site of the old Jewish cemetery, but but read it silently in the, the course of the book. Is it something that ever became an impulse for you in, in, along those lines? Oh, another big question. Um, <laughs> you know, of course, pursuing not not, not judging <laughs> pursuing Judaism is a is a multi facet. I mean, it's not even clear what exactly that means. Um, does it mean I mean, Go, do, going to shul? Do I have the, you know? the <laughs> inclination to become more religious? No, yeah. no, I don't. Um, uh, and but of course, pursuing the history, Jewish history. History of Jewish people? Yes, I mean, obviously, it's something that I have pursued, and it's sort of the way in which I've connected to to being Jewish. I suppose is through yeah. through this history. Um, yeah, there's. I mean, it's something that came up when I interviewed Dan Goldhagen. Frankly, you know, right. it was the same. We're Jewish. Should we really push it? I mean, it doesn't matter what we do. They're all going to consider us Jews anyway. Well, so. <laughs> and, that's, and that's the, actually, that's a point I wanted to make. Uh, uh, thanks for bringing yeah. that up again. Because, you know, one of the, there's so many cliches about how we speak about the Holocaust um, and, and how we frame the Jewish victims of the Holocaust or the victims of a Holocaust altogether. Um, and one of the things that we tend to say is, well, they were killed just because they were Jewish. And I don't think that that's accurate at all, actually. Um, they were killed because the Germans defined them as Jewish, um, or because others defined them as Jewish. It had absolutely nothing 
to do with how they saw themselves. And there were ultra-Orthodox who were killed. There were completely secular who were killed. There were people who had converted, whose families had converted to Protestantism or Christianity, you know, a generation or two before who were killed. So it had absolutely nothing to do with how they saw themselves and their relation to Jewishness. It had only to do with how others defined them. Yeah. Um, and, and so I see, you know, because they hate Jews, <laughs> Um, what they think of as a Jew doesn't, doesn't, I mean, I, you know, it, I speak as a, an American who trusts in our freedoms and in the rule of law. Um, that doesn't have yeah, anything to do, well, uh, of course. Yeah, I know, I'm kidding, I'm kidding. Go but yeah. speaking in a sort of that ideal way, you know, how they think of Jews doesn't have any effect on me. Of course, it has an effect on me, obviously. But, and it's something I have to defend against and be attentive to because they think that about me. But that still doesn't necessarily help me define my relation to my own Jewishness. Um, and so, you know, it's, it's a complex, complex thought to, you know, whether. Oh, I've been wrestling with it for years. I, yeah, I understand. <laughs> sure. Yeah, it, it reminds me, I was at a. In Copenhagen on a business trip once, I went to the the Jewish Museum there, and there was a a film they they have as part of the museum, and and apparently, history of Copenhagen Jews incredibly assimilated for you know generation upon generation, and then a bunch of of um, Orthodox or observant Jews were purged from Russia, ended up in in Copenhagen, and they said all of a sudden, we were all Jews. You right. know, we, we weren't allowed to be the, the, the middle class bourgeoisie, et cetera. Now we were lumped in with these guys in the black hats and, and fur and pay us right. because that's how everybody else saw us. But, you know, ultimately that's how they're always going to see us. But yeah, it's and, neither here nor there. And absolutely. And politically, and as a, pol you know, a conscious political being, um, <laughs> you know, a Jew is who I say is a Jew, right? I mean, that's the, right. the famous phrase. So I, uh, so I have to, I have to respond to that. I have to be prepared and I have to defend myself against that. Um, but I try um, with greater or lesser success to protect my internal sense of myself from, from that, if I can. Um, and because that relationship is a, is a complex one also, you know, my, I went to Hebrew school and it was a terrible experience and it, you know, if it, anything else it taught me, you know, this was absolutely what I didn't want to do. Um, and how I didn't want to relate to the religion um, or to the culture. Um, yeah. um, so, you know, I think for, for many of us who have the freedom to have that choice, it's a, a, something we wrestle with. Yeah. Now, to get even more meta and more personal, what were you looking for? You're in the book, but not, not deep, deep. I mean, you're there, but not there. Like there's the moment of I decided to quit writing my novel, mm -hmm. which I understand as an impulse. I've, I've quit it, you know, 5,000 times since <laughs> I was 20. Um, but yeah, that, that sense of, of the you underneath all this, there, there are, while you're relating the, the stories and, and making observations about the nature of memory and, and everything else, you know, who were you in that, that moment that this began? Yeah. Do you recognize how that changed? Oh, sure. Yeah. And the change is, is pretty profound. Um, well, I mean, I can come at that question a number of different ways. Um, there's, you know, I discovered the film just a couple of months before my father died. Mm -hmm. um, and this was my father's family. It was his parents who took the trip and his father's mother who was from Nashalsk. So the reason why um, the film exists at all is because my father's father went back to visit the town where his mother was from and where he was born. Um, so, you know, in the immediate aftermath of my father's death, I, I wrestled with this idea very much of what, you know, what remains when someone, when someone dies. What, what of them is left? And this idea of inheritance, what, what does the survivor of someone, um, or the heir, I guess, you know, like what's, you now hold their memory 
and and what what is that responsibility? What is what what um, what is the nature of that relationship now that it's just internal to to me? Um, I was thinking about my father, and well, this you know felt like a connection to his father, whom I never met, died before I was born. Um, so, you know, I think on some level, it was initially this sense of, well, I'm going to, I'm going to do this to honor my father and my father's father, right? In, in that biblical way. Um, and to understand, um, you know, a little bit more about them, because what do you really know about your parents as people when, and my grandfather? And what do you really know about your grandparents? I never met my grandfather. I don't even have personal recollections of him. Um, and yet somehow his personality, his, his presence was certainly there in my childhood. Um, and so, yeah, I, I mean, there was a sense of personal exploration via this project of, right, well, here's, I mean, what's, what remains of this community is this film, you know? So what else remains? What remains after the loss of that some, something so, so great? And I think that that was sort of where I started. That was my motivation at first. There's, you know, the intellectual fascination of, oh, what can I discover about this film? But that all changed. It either changed or it deepened when I met the first survivor, Mr. Mr. Chandler. So I pursued researching the film. I learned the, the actual town that it documents. And I looked for survivors and I looked for ways to answer this question of what are we looking at for two, almost two and a half years um, without, and I learned a great deal of, and I found a great deal of documentation. I learned lots of names, but I wasn't able to connect the research directly to the film. Um, uh, that's just, you know, a list of names from, say, a phone book, which is wonderful to have, and a film that shows hundreds of faces, right? There are two very rich sources of information, but there's simply no way to connect them if you don't have someone who can provide that bridge or, you know, some way to identify people. And two and a half years after I started, kind of out of the blue, I got this email from a woman in Detroit who had seen the film on the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum's website, where I had donated the original footage. And in the footage, in the film, in this one of these crowd scenes, she recognized her grandfather, who's still living, um, and uh, 90, 97 years old now. Um, 87 years old. In fact, yes, uh, sorry. Um, Friday was the 10th anniversary of the first time we met. Oh, wow. Um, yeah, it was, it was, yeah. I'm, I'm, the, the dates are fresh in my mind from reading the book. So yeah, yeah. Janu January 21st, 2012, um, I was in Florida and we went to his, his home there and watched the film together for the first time. And, but we had spoken on the phone a month before that for the very first time. And, you know, one of the very first things that he said to me, was, you know, and this was literally minutes after he'd seen the film for the first time. He said, you've given me back my childhood. Ah, oh, it gives me chills to even yeah. say that again. And I've said it, you know, a number of times. Um, you know, any, this is a man who lost his whole family, who lost, you know, his whole town, who lost his whole culture, right? And after a loss, like just that inconceivable to anyone else, like that, you know, what comes before your happy childhood, your innocent childhood before that, you know, it doesn't, didn't even seem real to him anymore. And then in this film, here he is, there he is with people that he knows running around, yeah. you know, trying to mug for the camera the way a kid would, right? Being a kid and just the fact that he was a kid um, was amazing to him. And to see it documented there, it yeah. opened up there something for him. And for me, hearing him say that, it sent this shock through me, you know, like, like I'm in possession of something that's capable of doing that for someone, of giving that to someone who has lost so much. 
And then there's hundreds of people in the film. Well, there must be, maybe there are others out there. I felt this tremendous sense of responsibility. I already felt it, you know, to the memory of these people, but now I felt it to the memories of possibly yeah. living people. And so, you know, whereas I think at first my motivation was really very personal. Oh, I, you know, this is for my father, for my grandfather. And then in a sort of intellectual sense, it's, oh, well, maybe I can document this community. When I met Mr. Chandler now, it was very personal for this person um, and possibly for other people. And as I say, I ultimately met seven other survivors, um, another one of whom, Feige Tick, um, is also in the film. You see her in the film, standing mm -hmm. next to the man who, who would become her husband. And to be able to show her herself and to show her and her children, you know, their father, husband and father, um, at that time, you know, that just to, that, that, I can't even describe what a gift it is to me to be able to give that gift to them. Um, and the, the depth of emotion that that, you know, encompasses and, and gathers is so, is so profound that I think I, that became really my motivation that I realized I was in possession of something in a sense living and not just a memorial. And that, that brings me back to the original question. Rather than how did you recover, how could the book end? You know, at what point did you, uh, unless you just want to say it's a book contract, I had to turn it in. You know, at what moment could you finally say, this is done? Yeah. You know, I, I need to, to stop and, and call it a book. Yeah. <laughs> of course, it's not done and it's still unfolding. Yeah, no, and things <laughs> happen, you know, things have happened this week, literally, that, um, you know, I didn't didn't know before. So that's that's incredible. Um, I, I had a, I mean, there were a couple of reasons why I wanted to finish the book. That is to say, to recognize, to, to, to yeah. sort of establish a more or less arbitrary ending point and just say, OK, I'm going to do the story I'm, that I can with what I have now. Um, and the first was I wanted it to come out when the survivors were still alive. Yeah. Um, and so I felt a great sense of time pressure for that because, I mean, these are people all in their, in their late 80s or 90s. Um, so I, I really wanted to do that. Also, you know, one of my goals with this story, I think with any Holocaust story, is to try to make palpable to people the magnitude of the loss. And I think for, for generations, that was done by citing the biggest figures and the largest scale um, history that you could grasp. How did the whole thing function? How many you know, millions were killed? But I think that there's been a turn in, that, in the historiography, certainly for the last 25 or 30 years, of trying to go small in a way to try and focus on individuals. Um, and, you know, one of the things that I, you know, I, I, I try to tell the story of these seven survivors and seven people. I frankly, just telling the story of one person would have been beyond my capacity. Um, you know, people are complex and lives are complex and memory is very complex and little small town life is very complex. And to really try and grasp even a fraction of that complexity takes a lot of space <laughs> in a text. Um, and so I had so much material um, that it was just, I, it was unmanageable, um, even with just these few people. And I realized, well, that's how you show what's lost, right? Like by showing how rich some tiny little fragment can be. And then you show, well, this is just a tiny little fragment of this whole. And 90% of that whole is just missing. Then you have a sense really for the magnitude of what, of what is lost. If one person's story can be so rich, imagine what 10 people's story would be like. Imagine what a community of 3,000 was like. And, and, and then you start to think, wait, 3,000, that's a tiny little town. Yeah. You know? And you, you go into that, especially the chain of of chance and fortune you know beginning with you finding the the film but you know the 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 ways you find or you come across mr chandler and the various things that all had to go right yeah in 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 this entire 
sequence, I guess, to, to be able to, to tell these stories. And like you say, this is just a single small town, basically three, well, 3,000 Jews, 4,000 or so people total. You know, I guess, I guess the question is, how did it make you look at your own life in terms of, <laughs> of continuousness and explicability? And if somebody were trying to reconstruct Glenn, <laughs> You know, how, how how far down a rabbit hole do they have to go before they say, well, this doesn't make any sense. Why would he have done this instead of that? <laughs> Good luck. I haven't even figured it out. I mean, <laughs> That's what I wonder. Do you try consciously to be more explicable or do you just give up on the face of it? No, I, I actually, I, I, I exist in a sense of wonder all the time at yeah. the, the complexity. I mean, of, you know, I, I try and convey this to students um, you know, I, you can hold up a, a piece of paper, a blank piece of paper, and say, you know, this is a history of Western industrial production. <laughs> because it is. Like, how did it get to be what it is? What is it composed of? What is the machine? How did it get to be standardized? Why does that the shape that it has? You know, what is the, are the, the transportation requirements? And it's blah, blah. The more you go into what is in that one object, the more complex you're suddenly intertwined in the history of you know Western industrial production. It's it's there in everything, and you can walk through your life <laughs> like that and just think you know like it's like Kafka esque, right? You just you could never take a step because you'd be stepping on and passing through so much density. But I I feel that, and there's a richness to it and an excitement to it, and it's exhausting also. You can't do it all the time, or it'll drive you mad. But if you pause and and linger, um, and I think, uh, let me linger over the word lingering for a moment, yeah. because, you know, yes, it's just one small town of 3,000 people, and yes, it's just a couple of survivors, and all of that is condensed into just three minutes of film. And I think that's one of the wonderful things about the documentary. It was, I mean, that's really this the wonderfully innovative thing about it is that it chooses not to show anything other than those three minutes. It takes those three minutes and makes 70 minutes of film out of them. And so it lingers in the same way that, again, sort of attentively, I tried to linger over these images. And I think, yeah, to answer your question again, to come very circuitously, there are no answers. We know that. <laughs> very circuitously back to to your question. Um, it's you know it's taught me that power of really lingering over things that the that so much can be excavated if you just pause and focus on something. And how has it affected your writing since? Well, <laughs> I'm not sure how to answer that question. That's um, why I ask. Yeah. Um, <laughs> uh, I won't ask about upcoming projects for fear of oh, jinxing that's okay. anything. No, but... that's okay. I, um, <laughs> let me say, you know, one of the things about writing three minutes was precisely because it, there was so much in every detail. I really and you alluded to this before, I really had to get myself out of the way in the writing of it. Um, there was so much going on that, you know, in one of the, in one of the many revisions of the manuscript before publication, I just kind of cut out every moment in which I stopped and thought about what was happening. Um, because it just, it wasn't necessary and it, um, and it seemed to clutter up. It, it made it less clear what was happening rather than than more clear. So, um, I mean, if you're asking the question how it has affected my writing in a technical sense, um, I, I find that I am trying now more and more to let the, to, to know exactly what it is I'm lingering over. I think that there's often a flaw in a lot of personal writing where what you linger over is your marvelous self. Um, and not the subject that you're trying to write about. Um, not that they're not deeply intertwined and not that one doesn't reveal the other and vice versa, but there's different registers here. Um, and, you know, lingering over the meaning of a photograph or lingering over the meaning of, um, you know, an idea. <laughs> 
um, even if it's your idea, is different than lingering over yourself. And yes, you reveal yourself through that thing, but I, I, I think of it sort of like, uh, like a musical performance. I'm a former musician. I think of a lot of things like a musical performance. But you know, when you're performing a piece of music, everything that you think and you feel is coming, has to be through that piece of music, right? You're not playing a different piece of music. You're not playing lots of the other pieces of music that you know and love or could play. You're playing that piece of music. And, and so the depth is in that particularity. And if you are able to bring depth to that particularity, then you've given a good performance. And that's, that's kind of how I feel. So I probably felt this before I wrote three minutes, but it's taught me, um, to, to try and be more attentive to the registers of, of what one can linger over. And I think as a younger person, you're much more, um, much more enth Friendly. enthralled by, um, by your own, uh, um, follows. Un uncertainties. Yeah. <laughs> that too. <laughs> exactly. And your own, you know, the marvelousness of your own, um, inexplicability. So to that end, you know, what did you learn about interviewing from this versus, and I know you've, you've, uh, you also have hosted, uh, uh, interview panels or, or sessions with writers otherwise, but, but this sort of interviewing and what occurs to me, or what occurred to me during the book, the sense where you almost had to be a detect, not almost, you had to be a detective in some ways with these interviews with the, the survivors and, and families, because they would tell you things that you had to connect to the, 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 the background of knowledge that you had, the names, the occupations, the, the locations, et cetera. You had to have all that in the back of your head and see if something they were saying was actually tripping some sort of clue. Sure. Um, anyway, I'm, but I'm putting words in your mouth. What did, what did that sort of interviewing teach you? Yeah. Or did it make you insufferable talking to other people? <laughs> no, that's only the case now, I think. Oh, good. <laughs> Subsequently. Um, it's been terrible for me, to be honest. I'm just kidding. Oh. Well, the first thing that it taught me was to shut up um, and that it wasn't about what I knew. Um, you know, there's a tendency when... Well, there's a tendency among, well, in my experience, among Holocaust survivors when talking about things that are difficult to talk about, to instead go general, to give a history lesson. Well, you don't know about Marshall Pilsudski? Well, then, let me tell you about Marshall Pilsudski when the question is, well, how did you feel? Right? Um, so, you know, in that, it's easy to get caught up in those history lessons and say, oh, yes, of course, I know who Marshall Pilsudski was. And in this way, you you prove that you know something, and you stop them from talking. And that's something I had to unlearn, right? I had to teach myself to just shut up and listen, um, and not try and prove that I knew what they were talking about. Um, and it's so that was the first thing that I learned. Um, then I learned also that to be really attentive to the emotional deflections and the cues and deflections um, when talking about these histories. Um, there's a moment in the book where I'm talking with Leslie Glodek, who ended up in the, in the UK, in London, um, and he was telling me his story and uh, at one point comes to a very difficult moment and he says, well, should I tell you? And being the polite, respectful person that I try to be, I said, well, you know, if you want to, <laughs> um, you know, it's up to you. If you, if you feel comfortable mm -hmm. telling, and that's the wrong thing to say. The answer was, yes, tell me. Um, and I had, so I had to learn in a sense that, you know, he was in a way asking for permission, but also it was a question more to himself. It was a, can I, can I say this? Can I go there? And, and I didn't help him. I should have helped him and say, you know, yeah, you can. Right. Um, and I, so I had to learn that. And, and then I'll say I had the great good fortune with, with Mr. Chandler of, I mean, we've been 
close now for 10 years, I, I was able to interview him, to listen to those interview, the recordings of those interviews, and then interview him again. And so through that, I became much more attentive to the places where he skips over things or where, you know, which I wouldn't have caught just listening or where, you know, there's a hesitation or there's some cue that there's something else going on there that's um, that's being left out. And of course, there can be very good reasons for leaving things out. But again, there's this kind of forensic quality. And yes, I'm we're friends, but I'm also trying to understand and dig into this story and to, to get at, you know, be, get beyond the habitual and sort of practiced things that he was willing to say and get at the deeper, you know, the more un, unclear and, um, and often more personal and powerful things that, that he experienced. And it took a lot of time to learn, to learn how to do that, um, and to, and how to do it in a respectful way and, and still do it. When one speaker's memories contradicted another one's, how difficult was it for you to hold back and say, wait, that's not right. Because someone earlier had told you something else. Well, it was never a question of knowing what was right. Because how could I? T how could I know? That, that's what right? that's what I'm wondering. Like, um, that, that initial reaction of, but wait, Murray just told me this. This right. can't possibly, you know, and realizing maybe the 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 facts are somewhere in between. But, sure. But yeah. Well, I, I mean, this is maybe a digression, but I'm not positive there are. <laughs> no, here there are of all facts. places, <laughs> <laughs> I'm not not so convinced by the by facts as as a. I, the, the word felt wrong coming out of my mouth. I was going to be honest, or even truth was going to sound a little wrong. But, but yeah, when, when you hear one thing and it's like, yeah, but the other guy said this was the person who was the blacksmith or or something. Right. You know. Yeah. Well, and, and I mean, of course, if I had that information to hand or if I had it on the tip of my tongue, I, I would I would say so. Like, well, you know, that's interesting because this other person said this and yeah. see if there was some reaction or whether there was some you know, is the person, no, I'm quite certain that was me. Or like, oh, wait a second, maybe, you know, like there's often a different Revision. conversation yeah. that happens then. Um, and another thing that I learned just sort of through, through repetition, through going through many, many interviews for years now, um, is that, um, you know, memories lead to other memories and that there are these kind of little eddies and, and, and blockages and, you know, it's this, it's this very complex current memory and, um, it can be loosed and it can be, you know, caught in all sorts of different ways. And frequently, um, you know, sort of having a, something jogging your memory can unleash, you know, a whole sort of flood of other things that you hadn't remembered that you remembered. Um, and that certainly happened often enough. So I, I was very attentive to how people remembered. And in fact, you know, I started out, I guess, somewhat naively trying to determine, okay, well, what happened? You know, what's, what are the facts of this, of this town? And I mean, something as simple as what day did the Germans arrive? Um, that's, uh, you know, there may be some documents hidden somewhere in, in German archives, you know, a report from the advance reconnaissance motorcycle brigade that, you know, went through town first and says what time they did. And so there's some factual answer to the question of what day did the Germans arrive. But I couldn't find it. And I certainly looked as hard as I knew how. Um, and if you talk to the survivors, you come up with different answers. And so pinning down what day did the Germans arrive, which seems like a factual question, you can't do it, or I couldn't do it. Um, and and then it's like, well, what do you actually mean by what day did the Germans arrive? Is it when the motorcycle rode through on its way somewhere else? Is that arriving? Or is it mean like when the tanks roll through on their way to Warsaw? Or is it when the occupation force comes in to take over the town? Is that when the Germans arrive? Like, so it may mean many different things and it may have happened on different days. So it, you know, the, <laughs> it's all about how carefully you frame your question, how carefully you frame your hypothesis, whether or not there's any kind of factual answer to it. Um, and, and I realized so that when I realized that, that no, this was a story about memories. 
Well, then that's a fascinating subject entirely. And instead of asking, well, what happened? My question became, well, how is what happened remembered? Which is a very different story. And then the fact that, you know, Mr. Chandler said that <laughs> one of yeah. Leslie Gluddick's, pro you know, proudest memories, one of his favorite <laughs> couldn't stories possibly couldn't possibly real. have happened. Um, well, that's just interesting. <laughs> right. That's, and that said something about these men as, as people. And it's, you know, you do further corroborate it at, at the very end of the book, right? It, uh, is it the afterward or somewhere? Leslie actually identifies more people who were part of this, this great, yes, he, which you won't get into as a, an yes, anecdote, but yeah, but yeah, the story of the horse. Um, <laughs> and yeah, I mean, did it really happen? I, I, I remain agnostic on that. Um, but the fact that Leslie remembers it and remembers it kind of so joyfully and with a great deal of detail, um, and that more he thinks it can't ever possibly have happened, you know, like yeah. that's, that's in and of itself already interesting. And it does go to that question of how is what happened remembered? And so it's, it adds complexity then to that question even though the facts can't be pinned down. Tell me about your literary upbringing. How'd oh, you become a writer? Oh, that's another great question. Um, How do you remember becoming a writer? <laughs> we'll put it that way. Yeah. Well, I, um, I started out as a musician um, from a very young age. I was, um, uh, I started playing guitar when I was like six years old or so. I started taking lessons when I was seven. Um, and that was what I wanted to do. And I ultimately went to a conservatory and had something of a professional career into my 20s. So it was something I pursued seriously um, for a long time. And that was really all I wanted to do. That was the only way I had imagined myself was as becoming a, a performing musician. Um, all along, I also enjoyed writing. <laughs> Um, and I kept, you know, notebooks, if not exactly diaries, and I read a lot um, and enjoyed enjoyed that. Um, and there's something, I, I will say that there's something about music and narrative that seem like kind of the same thing to me, um, narrative and broadly conceived. Um, I they, they just, they talk to me, t to each other for me in a way that I can't, extricate their, they seem like the same thing um, musical lines and literary lines or, or just language you know lines of sentences they, they I can't get the music out of them and I can't get the story out of them I guess in a way um, however whatever kind of narrative it happens to be it's just true of Schoenberg as it is of you know Mozart um, so there was always something there, I suppose, um, that connected the two for me. But then, um, as I talk about in my first book, Practicing. Um, Which I know. I haven't read. I understand. Don't guilt me. I know we're Jewish. I'm just kidding. <laughs> oh, I'm not guilting you. I'm just plugging it. It's a, um, about this this loss of the musical career. I, I reached a sort of crisis point in my mid-20s where, you know, like how many concert gu classical guitarists are there in the world who make a living? There's not a yeah. lot. Um, and I sort of reached that crisis moment where I thought, well, it doesn't seem like I'm going to be one of them. And that's what I've been working on since working towards since I'm, I don't know, 10 or 12 years old. So well, who am I if I'm not that? Um, and um, so I, I quit music um, and then didn't know who I was or what to do with my life. Um, and what do you do when you don't know who you are or what to do with your life? What do you do? You go to graduate school. <laughs> so I went to graduate school. Um, and I thought, well, the only other thing I enjoy doing, you know, is writing. So maybe that's a good way to be a writer, showing once again graduate how school, naive that I was. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. But ultimately, about 10 years or so after I quit music, and I mean, that was, that was a terribly painful breakup for me. Um, uh, the most painful up to that time that I had ever experienced. Um, and as is often the case when your heart is broken, it takes a long time for you to be able to kind of come back and look at it and think, well, why did that happen? Why did it happen that way? So 10 years or so after I quit music, I had that 
thought. I was like, wait a second, this used to be the center of my life. And now it's barely even present. How did that happen? And I, and what would happen if I started again? And I tried to start again. And that's what the book Practicing is about. And I thought of what if I start again, not as a, a, a sort of restarting of my career as a professional musician, but I thought of it as a literary endeavor. What would that experience be like? And I started documenting it. And it turned into this, this first book. So that was how I became a writer, was by thinking through the loss of my career as a musician. Um, I think it was that book that, that made me into a writer. And it somehow trans, it just, it took that melding of music and language and just kind of turned it, turned it around for me. And the conversations on practice interviews that you, you did? Yeah. That or was, was there a sense of, boy, if I could figure out how other writers do it, I can make a career out of this. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, it's funny. So uh, not that I'm giving away what I do with the podcast, but, but go on. <laughs> well, no, that's exactly, exactly right. <laughs> and also I think like you, you mentioned in, in uh, your description of the podcast, it's a way to meet some of your heroes. Um, so there was, there was that also. Mm -hmm. um, but no, I had given a lot of readings from practicing and at some point I, from the book practicing. Um, and I was tired at some point of, of giving those readings. And I thought, well, I'm really curious how other people practice. And practice is something people often just talk about without talking about. Yeah. <laughs> they talk about talking about it without actually talking about it. Like, you know, you always get at, uh, you know, at any like MFA reading or something, it's like, well, what's your process? Everyone wants to know. But well, it was the old writers at work Paris Review interviews it, it, from me when I was in my 20s. I was photocopying those because I'm also old, um, <laughs> <laughs> going to a library, getting those and, and, you know, finding out what William Gaddis purported to actually do to, to write. But yeah, go on. Thanks for mentioning William Gaddis. I love William Gaddis. He's oh, gosh. Not yeah, I, I really have to go back, except the podcast makes such a demand on my reading time. Yeah, that a thousand page novel isn't really in the cards <laughs> yeah. for you. That's my, I, I got to get to JR eventually, yes. but uh, maybe when the podcast is on the back burner. <laughs> well, I think the Paris Review does actually go into practice in, in a depth and, uh, you know, in a way that very few other interviews tend to. Um, so I really love those. And that's a, it's a great reference. And it was a touchstone for me. Um, but I started doing those conversations on practice, really, again, because I really was just interested in hearing how other people approach the problem of being a writer. Um, and it wasn't exclusively about writers at first. Um, I also talked to musicians and dancers. And I was just really curious. And I thought that it would be interesting in an interdisciplinary way to get a group of people together for each of these, you know, and have us do a sort of comparative conversation about, well, how do you approach problems? What are the problems that you come up with in the course of trying to work something out? And how do you get through them? What do you do with them? Um, it became just logistically hard to get more than one person at a time, you know, <laughs> on the same night in the same place. Um, so it ended up being, you know, single interviews with individuals. And then it kind of narrowed again down to, to writers because it was being hosted by a bookstore. Um, but, um, yeah, it was really, I mean, it's just a subject that I find en en enormously interesting, not as much the, where do you get your ideas um, yeah, I know. as, all right, well, when you have, like, what do you do with them? Like, how do you take the ideas of which we all have many, um, and like, which ones are the ones that you pursue and how do you pursue it? And what do you do when it leads you down a dead end? And, you know, what are the the techniques that you've developed to manage yourself in the course of that process, um, you know, and the voices in your head, which are saying, Oh, you'll never do this. Oh, this is stupid. Oh, nobody's going to want to read this. Um, and, um, you know, what do you, what do you do? How do you manage yourself as a writer and how do you work with the material on a really, you know, not so old level? Did you ever come up with a, any sort of overlapping trait that worked or that, that was, you know, common for, for many of them or were they all really distinct? I, I think of some of the people you've recorded or interviewed or some of the people I've, I've sat down with. And unfortunately, David Shields is among them. I'm just kidding. I, I love David. <laughs> we're getting together wonderful, in a couple of months. Guy, again. Wonderful writer. Yeah. And fun to talk to. Very fun to talk to. 
Um, well, I mean, yes, of course. There's one thing that everyone says, which is you have to figure it out for yourself. Um, sure. And that trying to re figure out how to be a writer by reading the Paris you know, review interviews <laughs> is never going to work. You have to put your butt in the chair and struggle with it. And you have to figure out how you get through these problems and how you work with material. Um, and that's something everyone says <laughs> and is very, of course, hard hard to do. And I think the reason why you get that question at MFA workshops is like, how do you, what is your process? Is because everybody's trying to kind of take a shortcut through that hard work. Um, like, okay, well, if, if I do what you do and it works for you, then probably it'll work for me and I won't have to actually figure out how I work. Um, yeah. But you have to figure out how you work. That's understood. I'll figure it out. I'm only 51. I've, I've got time, <laughs> I figure. <laughs> exactly. The next 50 years. Yeah. Now, the last question, and this is going to be all fraught with Gill subtext that you don't have to deal with in the slightest, but you mentioned how the book, how Three Minutes, was a, a sort of you know, conversation with your, your father's memory um, in, in terms of finding the film after his death and, and, and everything. Is there something you wish you had asked him specific to what Three Minutes became? Is there there's something that oh God, I wish my father could have told me X about his father or you know the upbringing. I'm just leaving it wide open. What do you wish you asked your father? Oh, well, there's so many things I wish I'd asked my father. Um, not honestly, they're not mostly about this story. He was 13 years old when it when it took place, um, yeah. and. You know, he was still alive when I found the film, so I was able to ask him, you know, what did he remember of his parents' trip and what does he know about the film? But, you know, he died before I learned really where the film was from. The story in the family was that it was my grandmother's hometown. Um, my grandmother survived my grandfather for 30 by 30 years. Um, so somehow over the course of that time, the, the trip became the trip to her hometown rather than the trip to his hometown. So, you know, he, my father never knew the truth about this film. And I'm, I'm, I, I feel bad about that. Um, and I certainly wish that he had lived to see what's become of it. I mean, you know, just, it was amazing to him that that the Holocaust Museum, you know, wanted to preserve this footage. That was an extraordinary thing. Then, I mean, to imagine that a frame from this film would end up on the front page of the New York Times, <laughs> um, on their website, I should say, I should add. Still. Um, but still, that, you know, it's mind, it's mind boggling to me. And I wish, you know, in, in the vein of this somehow being a tribute to him and his family, in that vein, I wish he had lived to see that. I think it would have been terribly meaningful to him. And of course, he'd have also gotten a kick out of it. Um, there would be something fun about it to him. And I feel that way about my grandfather as well. I think that he would just have found it, in addition to profound and moving, would have just found it, you know, funny and unbelievable in a almost comical, farcical way that this silly little travel souvenir with this little gadget that he picked up on a whim should end up having so much importance and having changed so many people's lives. I wish that they had, I could convey that to them. Um, and I wish I could talk to my father about all the stuff you never ask your father about, you know, when you're too young or too busy or too absorbed in your own life to, to really wonder. Or resentful. There's always resentful. And, and that's the resentful. Gill subtext under all this stuff. So <laughs> we, we won't get into that. I get into that on the side anyway. But yeah, there's, you know, you want to have a real conversation with them about what their life has been like and what, you know, what he experienced growing up and what um, his relationship to his parents was not like, oh, grandma was a wonderful, you know, like, but really talk to them like a, like a mensch. What, what did you struggle with? What did you feel? What, you know, how did you deal with it? You know, what was your life like? What is your life like? I mean, one of the strange, strange things about this story is I spent so much time talking with Mr. Chandler, who appears in the film as a 13-year-old boy, about his childhood. I know much more about it. I know many more stories about his childhood than I know about my father's. 
So I wish I'd given him <laughs> the, the attention and interviewed him with the attentiveness that, um, that, I, that I gave to, to the survivors that I met. I'm sure he would have been proud. So. Thank you. Hi, Glenn, thanks so much for coming on. I, I hope we get to do this in person. And it's why I, I didn't ask about upcoming projects. I do hope there's, there's you know, more books in the works that we can talk about. There, there are, and I would very much look forward to it, Gil. It's, it's really a pleasure and it's a, an honor. You uh, have talked to many people I deeply admire and indeed many friends as well. And I'm really, I'm really grateful to be, to be among them. Thank you. And that was Glenn Kurtz. Go read Three Minutes in Poland. It's an amazing book. Um, yes, it'll depress you, but it's, it's, it's truly a miracle that it even exists. And it's a wonder to, to see what Glenn's done with it. And try to catch the documentary, Three Minutes, A Lengthening. Uh, if it's at a festival near you or gets wider release or shows up on streaming, it's really an amazing book. And it's especially important at our, our present moment. I, I can't wait to see the film and, and what the director has done with it and how they incorporate Glenn and Maury Chandler and other people into the uh, into those three minutes. Now, Glenn has Twitter and Instagram accounts, but he is really not active on social media as near as I can tell. And as we all know, that's for the best. But his website is glennkurtz.com. And there's plenty of info there about his books, the documentary, his old conversations on practice series and a series of interviews and more. So that's G-L-E-N-N-K-U-R-T-Z. Dot com, and I'll have a link to that in the show notes for this episode. Now, you can support the Virtual Memory Show by um, telling other people about it. Just let them know that there's this great show out there where this dude is just recording interviews with people, conversations really, just with creative folks about their work, their lives, what they've learned, and, uh, and of course, you know, who they're reading. You can also support the show by telling me what you like and don't like about it, who you want to hear me record with, what movie or TV show, book, piece of music, piece of theater, art exhibition, whatever you think I should turn listeners on to. You can do that by uh, emailing me, DMing me if we're connected on Twitter or Instagram. Um, send me postcards. I love postcards. I've been sending out postcards every day of 2022. It's been my resolution, except for Sundays. Um, I, I have a huge mailing list of people, and I just randomly send postcards. And I just got more postage so I can send to uh, non-U.S. recipients now. But anyway, send postcards, letters, uh, email. Leave a voice on my Google Voice number. Um, the messages are only three minutes long goes directly to voicemail so you don't have to worry about me picking up uh, but the number for that is 973-869-9659 um, if you leave the message there tell me if it's okay to use that in an upcoming episode of the show i would never run your your voicemail without your approval first now if you have money to spare uh, or other resources then help individuals and institutions in need. You can find people through GoFundMe, Patreon, Kickstarter, Indiegogo. Um, Tapatico has a new Kickstarter-y sort of thing going on also. I'll add that to this, uh, this roster next time around. Uh, but what I'm saying is there are a lot of people you can help uh, different ways. Some people need help with artistic projects. Some people need help making rent or paying medical bills. There's a lot of things you can do to, to help people out. So I hope you will. Now, if it comes to uh, institutions in need, um, you can't, can't go wrong with your local food bank, the Poor People's Campaign, Freedom Funds, Election Funds, as we're now seeing funds to supply copies of Art Spiegelman's Mouse to people who are in districts where that has been pulled from the shelves. There's a lot of other um, book reviews going on where libraries are being forced to uh, account for some of the things that are in there. There are ways you can help fund uh, the fight against that sort of censorship. So go out there, do the research and um, try to kick in some funds and your time and help make a better world. Our music for this episode is Fella by Hal Mayforth. Use with permission from the artist. You should visit my archives to check out my episode with Hal from the summer of 2018 and learn more about his art and painting. 
And you can listen to his music at soundcloud.com slash May 4th. And that's M-A-Y, the number four, T-H. And that's it for this week's episode of the Virtual Memories Show. Thanks so much for listening. We'll be back next week with another great conversation. You can subscribe to the Virtual Memories Show and download past episodes at the iTunes Store. You can also find all our episodes and get on our email list at either of our websites, vmspod.com or chimeraobscura.com slash vm. You can also follow the Virtual Memory Show on Twitter and Instagram at vmspod, at virtualmemoriespodcast.tumblr.com, and on YouTube, Spotify, and TuneIn.com by searching for Virtual Memories Show. And if you like this podcast, please tell your pals, talk it up on social media, and go to iTunes, look up the Virtual Memory Show, and leave a rating and maybe a review for us. It all goes to helping us build a bigger audience. You've been listening to the Virtual Memories Show. I'm your host, Gil Roth. Keep reading, keep making art, and keep the conversation going. 